This week, what the paper says, presented by Paul Foote, columnist on the Daily Mirror. Good evening. I'm sorry to start this programme up again on a sombre note, but it's been a grim week for journalists. This morning's Guardian reported... Bazoft's body <laughs> returns. The body of Fazad Bazoft, the observer journalist hanged in Iraq last Thursday, is to be thrown to Britain today, the Foreign Office said. He will be buried in Highgate Cemetery, London. The first news of the murder broke in early morning, a week ago yesterday. The London Evening Standard told us... Iraq hangs observer journalist. Fazad Bazoft, the observer journalist sentenced to death for spying, was executed today by the Iraqi regime and his body delivered to the British Embassy. According to a British diplomat allowed to see Mr. Bazoft before the execution, he went to the gallows, insisting... I was just a journalist going after a scoop. Quite a scoop it would have been, too. On the very day last September that Farzad Bazoft left Britain at the invitation of the Iraqi government to cover elections in Kurdistan, the Independent led its front page with this. Huge explosion at secret Iraqi missile plant. Up to 700 people were killed in a vast explosion last month at a secret defence establishment near Baghdad, where Iraq is believed to be developing missile technology. The Independent's long report was compiled by Harvey Morris and Adele Darwish in London and Tim Kelsey in Ankara. No one in Iraq and no one available at the Iraqi embassy. The Iraqi embassy in London was not immediately available last night to comment on reports of the disaster. It was the secrecy surrounding the disaster which Farzad Bazoft courageously confronted. He visited the site and took soil samples, was arrested, tortured, tried in a kangaroo court and hanged. In the early shock after the hanging, the press demanded drastic action against what the London Evening Standard called a stupid and brutal regime. Britain has to break off diplomatic relationships with Iraq. To do less would be to suggest that there might have been some justice in taking the life of Mr. Bazoft. I'm sure most journalists agreed with that most heartily. The admirable UK Press Gazette summed up the mood in a single word. Outrage. He gave his life for trying to report the truth. But almost at once the emphasis changed. The image of the brave reporter hunting a scoop was quickly transformed. Here was last Friday's son. Hanged man was a robber. Exclusive. By Simon Walters. The British newsman hanged in Iraq yesterday was a convicted robber. A security source revealed last night. That security source told Simon Walters of the parliamentary staff of the Sun that Farzad Bazoft had robbed £500 from a building society when he was a penniless student ten years ago. Someone also told the Press Association, even earlier than the Sun, as early as 2.55pm on the day of the hanging, the Press Association's political correspondent, Chris Moncrief, had written this article. It started, Observer reporter Farzad Bazoft, executed in Baghdad for alleged spying, served a prison sentence in Britain for robbery. Who told the Press Association? Government sources, said tonight. Aha! Government sources. Which government sources? The following day, the Mirror's Sylvia Jones wrote this. A Tory MP dished the dirt on hang newsman Farzad Bazoft in a bid to justify the government's feeble response to the barbaric execution. He leaked details of 31-year-old Bazoft stretching jail to try to discredit him at the height of world outrage about the hanging. At the same time, the government declared there would be no break in diplomatic relations with Baghdad and no trade sanctions. The coincidence was engineered by Whitehall's Dirty Tricks Department. Last night, the finger was being pointed at the Home Office. There was some confirmation of this the following day in the Sunday correspondent. The Foreign Office yesterday repeated its vehement denial that it had been responsible for any leak. A Home Office spokesman refused to comment. How important was the 1980 robbery to the 1990 hanging? Even the cashier at the building society Bazoft robbed didn't think it terribly relevant. Today reported her saying, He frightened me to death at the time, but I would not have wanted him to be hanged. Some papers reported the news of the robbery appropriately. The Guardian buried it deep in its main story last Friday. It emerged last night within Whitehall that Bazart was convicted at Northampton Crown Court in 1981. The Times did the same. So did the Daily Telegraph, well down in the main story. It emerged last night that Mr. Bazart was convicted... But other papers succumbed to the Sun hysteria. The Daily Mail first edition last Friday morning had a moving story of Fazad's last message to his girlfriend. Don't cry for me, Ruth. Doomed reporter's last message to British girl. But when the Mail night editor saw the Sun exclusive, he changed the front page. Hanged man was a robber. Revealed shadowy past of observer reporter. 
Not to be outdone, the Daily Express changed its front page. Shady past of Hank Mann. The Daily Express can reveal, thanks to the Sun and the Press Association, that Bazoft, who was hanged by Iraq at dawn yesterday, served time in a British jail for robbing a building society. Thus, three national daily newspapers, with a combined circulation of some eight million, featured a small building society robbery ten years ago more prominently than the hanging of a journalist for pursuing a story. Nor were they finished with him yet. No sooner had the readers of Friday's papers absorbed the fact that the hanged man was a robber than Saturday's papers were bombarding him with a news smear. Bazoft, a perfect spy for Israel, says MP. That was the Daily Mail. Here was today. Bazoft was an Israeli agent. Note those inverted commas. They mean that someone says Bazoft was an Israeli agent. Who could that be? Tory MP Rupert Allison, who uses the pen name Nigel West, said... It is highly likely he tried to capitalise on his knowledge by offering information to Israel. Mr Allison then produced his evidence. He had contacts in the Middle East, spoke Farsi and worked for a reputable newspaper. Mr Allison has some very good sources in MI5. So has the other source of last Saturday's smear. Here was the sun. Top espionage expert Chapman Pincher last night supported claims that Farzad Bazoft spied on Iraq for Britain. He said Bazoft could have established links with MI6 after his jail sentence for robbery. By Sunday, it was perfectly clear that Farzad Bazoft was not a spy. The Observer rose to its journalist's defence. Bazoft, not a spy. Official. Highly placed government sources who have made exhaustive checks with international intelligence agencies last night categorically confirmed that Observer journalist Farzad Bazoft was not a spy. The Observer reporter John Merritt also revealed... Mr Pincher said yesterday that he had been misquoted and never said, or intended to say, that Bazoft was a spy. The Observer's line was well supported by the Sunday newspapers. British intelligence sources told the Sunday Times it would be inconceivable for either MI5 or MI6 to take on someone of Bazoft's criminal background. He is exactly the kind of man we would not have anything to do with. And the Mail on Sunday had... Hanged Bazoft, cleared of spying. But the stories about the robbery and the spying had already had one important effect. The early demands for tough trade sanctions quickly dried up. A more realistic view began to prevail. A Today leader pointed out, Withdrawing our ambassador and sending home a few students will hardly rock the Hussein regime or teach it civilised manners. We are, however, in no moral or practical position to do more. The Daily Mail agreed. The temptation to respond further by breaking off diplomatic relations should be resisted. Woodrow Wyatt of the News of the World, who can usually be relied upon to tell us what they are thinking in 10 Downing Street, chimed in realistically. It's ridiculous to reduce or cut off our trade. Instead, Lord Wyatt recommended... Maximising trade and saying nothing more about Bazoft. A powerful voice against this sort of stuff was raised by the master columnist Keith Waterhouse in the Daily Mail on Monday. He recalled a family, the Belchers, in the street he was brought up in. The father was a drunk, the mother a slut. The eldest sons collectors of lead from church roofs and the younger ones incorrigible street urchins. The Belchers were tolerated by their neighbours who traded with them, chiefly in rhubarb, until one day... Arriving back drunk as usual one Sunday afternoon, Mr Belcher staggered into the wrong house and began throwing crockery about. The whole street responded in outrage. The boycott was total. The Belchers, by their behaviour, had forfeited their place in a civilised community. Keith Waterhouse concluded, Self-righteous or not, I believe we were on morally higher ground than the British exporters, whose immediate reaction to the execution of Farzad Bazoft was that it must not be allowed to threaten the £450 million worth of business we are doing with Iraq. The view is that they are businessmen, not politicians, and that they have achieved good personal contacts in Iraq, which should not be affected. Of course not unless they decide to hang a few British exporters, when I bet it would quickly turn out that we don't have to trade with the Iraqis after all. As I say, a voice in the wilderness. Most editors and commentators moved on from insulting the dead man to criticising his editor. This new sport started in the Daily Express last Saturday. Editor blamed over Bazoft's death trip. Tory MPs criticised Observer editor Donald Trofford last night for sending Farzad Bazoft on the assignment that led to his death. They said it was highly irresponsible for the newspaper to send an Iranian with a hidden past on such a dangerous mission. Senior backbenchers said the criticism levelled at the government over the affair should be directed at Mr Trelford. The Express complimented this news story with a vast editorial attacking the Observer, which ended with a piece of humbug so monumental that I will quote it. If this affair, about which we may still not have had the last revelation, causes some newspapers to reassess their methods and standards, then Farzad Bazoft's sad and needless death will not have been entirely in vain. 
past the sick bag, Alice, as old John Juno used to say in the Sunday Express. In the mail on Sunday, however, old John Juno was calling up sick bags all over the other people's efforts with spying, for which the ultimate penalty must, alas, in some circumstances be paid. So remote was the telegraph from fact-gathering disciplines that he could not even tell the story straight. It said the observer sent Buzz off to Iraq five times, when the truth was that Iraq invited him six times, on two of which he offered stories as a freelance writer to the observer. On this uncertain base, the pride of Tory Sunday journalism produced the most weaseling and morally insensate explanation that the Iraqi government can ever have expected to read. A propaganda gift from Peregrine Worsthorn to Saddam Hussein, with a subtext for Western eyes, which says that investigative journalism is a punishable offence against the state. Hugo Young then summed up the whole week's work on the Bazoft atrocity by the journalists who might have been expected to have shelved their petty squabbles and circulation wars in exchange for a little solidarity with a murdered colleague. Thus was an event of utmost horror rendered banal, even excusable. The deed was done not by politicians. The damage comes instead from journalists rounding on one of their own, on the paper he was working for, on the very function their profession is supposed to perform. Before Fazad Bazov's name recedes over the horizon, let it be said clearly what happens did he deserve the gallows. Nor does Baghdad deserve one sentence of validating comfort. Bazov was a victim, foully murdered, period. There is nothing at all to add to that. Good night. <laughs>